Well, thank you everyone for coming uh, to this um, session of the Mexican Studies Seminar. Uh, my name is Emilio Curie. I'm director of the CAT Center for Mexican Studies at the University of Chicago. And today we are truly delighted to welcome back to the seminar uh, Benjamin Smith, um, who was last year, uh, quite a few years ago, uh, and is now a uh, professor uh, of history at the University of Warwick in England. Uh, he is, as uh, all of you know, a, a very distinguished and prolific historian of modern Mexico, the author of numerous books and also edited volumes. I'll just cite a couple. His first book, Pistoleros and Popular Movements, The Politics of State Formation in Post-Revolutionary Oaxaca. His most recent book, uh, prior to the one that we're gonna talk about today, The Mexican Press and Civil Society, 1940, 1976. Uh, and also a series of influential edited uh, volumes, uh, best known of which is the one he did with uh, um, Paul Gillingham, Dick Tablanda, Politics, Work, and culture in Mexico in 1938, 1968. Uh, and today we have asked him to come talk to us about his new, newest and certainly already quite popular uh, book, uh, The Dope, uh, The Real History of the Mexican Drug Trade. Uh, as usual, um, uh, he will speak for 30, 35 minutes and then we'll open the floor for your questions and comments. So with that, uh, welcome back, uh, Ben. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Emilio, and thank you very much, Alberto, for organizing uh, this event uh, at Chicago. Um, so I should say at the outset, this uh, talk, I was thinking of doing a talk uh, of kind of historical sociology simply to alienate everyone. Uh, however, I've been persuaded by Emilio, and I think you should all uh, thank him for this, uh, for actually doing a much more popular and I hope broadly entertaining, if informative talk, uh, about my book, uh, The Dope, The Real History of the Mexican Drug Trade. Um, I've been asked to speak for about 30 minutes, so I'm going to look at three things. Uh, the first is why I wrote this book. Second is how I wrote it. Uh, and then third, what did I find? Um, so over the last few months, I've done a fair amount of press and radio interviews on the book, and people usually start by asking why I'm researching the Mexican drug trade. Well, I should say at the outset, this was never my intention. Um, when I arrived in Mexico two decades ago, I didn't come for the drugs or the violence or even the booze, uh, although as a kind of bookish Brit, I had uh, a certain respect for Graham Greene's whiskey priest uh, and Malcolm Lowry's mescal soaked consul. Um, like many naive 20 somethings, um, I arrived in Mexico for the politics. Um, the early 2000s were a bit of a dead zone for want to be radicals. Uh, and to a bored London journalist, Mexico seemed the place to be. Uh, it had a relative, it had a re revolutionary history, untarnished by famines or pogroms. It had a national palace plastered with comic strip murals of dashing heroes. And it had an authentic or indigenous movement in the form of the balaclava clad Zapatistas. And hey, the year I arrived, they were on tour. Um, <clears throat> if I came to the politics then, I stayed for the people. Living in southern Mexico, working as an English teacher, um, I fell in love with the country and its communities. I fell in love with the people's warmth, their kindness, friendship, their wisdom, their bleak humour. Uh, and when I returned after a year to Cambridge to pursue a PhD in 17th century English alchemy, uh, I immediately gave it up and switched to studying Mexico. Over the next decade or so, I threw myself into researching and writing about a variety of things, 19th and 20th century Mexican politics, indigenous lawmakers, rabble rousing market women, militant religious movements and anti-communist rebels. I was also at the same time lucky enough to marry into a vast Mexican family full of terrifying thundering aunts and quiet shuffling good humored uncles. Like so much of Mexico, they're spread everywhere from China to Italy to Brazil, to Mexico City to Tijuana to Los Angeles. They're artists, they're engineers, they sell juice and they work for NASA. Together they can cover three indigenous dialects, sing song Oaxaca Spanish, Chilango slang, English, both UK and US, Spanglish, Portuguese and Mandarin. Christmas is chaos. They're a Mexican success story and one that re represents many of the positive changes that have occurred in Mexico over the past half century but they're not entirely representative. And in the last seven or eight years, two forces have pushed me to leave the past and try to write about the Mexico I see rather than the one perhaps I want to imagine. The first then is intellectual. 
The dope is an attempt to understand things that I think I and a lot of historians have ignored or at least underestimated. An illicit economy, um, an influential police force, and a war that has been going on for longer than most of our lifetimes. The dope is also a bid to contextualize these things, not in the bleak apocalyptic imagery of true crime, but in the Mexico I fell in love with, and which still exists in the inspiring cries of, true, of civil society, but also in the form of the people themselves, of the Mexicans who make most of the country. The second reason, however, I wrote this book is much more personal. Over the past two decades, tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands of Mexicans have fled Mexico for the United States. They've fled everything from land grabs and family feuds, through extortion and kidnapping, to human trafficking and illegal mining. Around 2012, a small handful of lawyers started to approach me and asked for help assessing the risk to these Mexican, uh, Mex Mexican refugees. And over the past next five years or so, I sat down occasionally in person, uh, sometimes at the end of a telephone line to talk to them. I listened to their stories and I helped put together their petitions for asylum. But their stories pushed me in another way to attempt to understand the roots of Mexico's contemporary violence, uh, but also how the Mexico I lived in and I fell in love with had descended into the Mexico, which was forcing so many people to, free, to flee. Now, if these were the two reasons that pushed me to write the book, my next hurdle was how to do it. Now, as you might expect, researching an illegal industry is a pretty tough job. On the one hand, drug trafficking is enveloped in myths. These myths tell a pretty simple story of a war between North and South, between white and brown, between noble and well-intentioned cops, and a threatening cabal of kingpins, politicians, and shadowy, powerful cartels. Such myths may contain granules of truth, but in essence, they're myths, they're propaganda. They obscure rather than clarify. They also serve a, a clear propagandist purpose. They demonize the drug traffickers and they cement the narrative of the drug trade as a struggle between good and evil. They legitimize official violence. Drug cops carry guns because they must fight well-armed traffickers. They shoot, but apparently only when shot at. If the drug trade is shrouded in myth, it's also shrouded in secrecy. In fact, just tracing the identities of traffickers is difficult enough. Some have shifted between a dozen or so different aliases in just a few years. For example, the Mafia's man in Mexico in the 1940s was, according to the press, a master of disguise. He switched between six different names, including Max Cosman, John Smith and Max Weber, clearly had a sense of humor. He moved between homes in Tijuana, Guadalajara and Mexico City and endured at least two major and not terribly successful plastic surgeries. He was scarred, according to one unimpressed Mexico City go gossip columnist, like a common pimp. Unpacking these myths then and pulling aside the veil of secrecy and discovering the real story of Mexico's drug trade has not been easy. The stereotypes particularly are firmly entrenched and they configure the way the documents are written and structure the way we read them. They shape the way we told these stories in the past. But researching the drug trade I did find was possible. Cataloging and declassification programs have started to open up political, judicial and private archives on both sides of the border. Um, and on the back of a, a grant from the British government, over the past five years, I visited about 50 of these collections. Um, and I found a wealth of material from the records of the US and Mexican drug police uh, to the court transcripts of the Guadalajara cartel to the property titles linking local potentates to major traffickers. Now I combined these orthodox archival finds with a plethora of classified US and Mexican documents. Some came through Freedom of Information Act or FOIA applications. Uh, others were given to me very kindly uh, by, uh, from private collections. Uh, they include the photo album of a major Sinaloa kingpin, classified DEA and customs documents from about half a dozen DEA and, and Mexican police officers, and the sole known photograph of the legendary trafficker and El Chapo's mentor, Pedro Aviles Perez, on a mortuary slab with half his head missing. I also did about 40 uh, interviews with those involved in the drug trade and its policing. 
Many were DEA, evident, uh, DEA officers down in Mexico in the 70s and 80s, and they let me into the murky world of US drug policy, the characters, the clashes, and the gung-ho attitude to lives and laws. Um, uh, they also included dozens of US marijuana smugglers who moved into the trade in the 1960s, showed Mexican farmers how to grow sinsamia, and made deals with Mexican cops to monopolize the buying up of weed in certain regions. They also include um, uh, older Mexican growers and smugglers from the states of Sinaloa, Oaxaca, and Guerrero. The last thing then I want to say about how I write this, uh, how I uh, put together this book is about the writing itself. Benjamin. So much impo impo important academic literature from history to sociology to political science is written. In, he's, he's, in, attended, uh, he's attended some of my papers. Hello. Um, I feel Can so you please good. mute yourself, whoever's talking, thank you. Getting paranoid. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, so uh, a lot of this, this work is written in what I might class as a kind of high Baroque style and is somewhat impenetrable to the uninitiated. Um, and I think you spend most of your PhD and most of the first decade of your career aping this. Even most pop history uh, is written in what I term kind of Oxbridge English, but in the US you might term Ivy League or New Yorker style, all thesaurus adjectives and forced metaphors. Um, so anyway, for the dope, I uh, attempted, uh, I read a lot of James Elroy, a lot of Dashiell Hammett, a lot of Raymond Chandler, and I attempted to strip away all the kind of extraneous stuff and tell the story of the Mexican drug trade using techniques drawn from the de detective literature. Short vignettes to introduce the characters, a deliberately staccato beat, action scenes interspersed with background description, and a tone of world-weary cynicism. I tried, and I realized saying this out loud sounds unbelievably pretentious to write a kind of noir history. So anyway, that's enough about the rather self-conscious ideas of how I wrote this book um, and why I wrote it. I wanna start, I wanna end this uh, talk on the last part of this talk to deal with what I've found. So if you read the book, you can see and it deals with about hundred years of Mexican drug smuggling and the efforts against it. You can read about the cross-dressing border smuggler Enrique Fernandez, who pioneered the Ciudad Juarez trade. You could read about the mysterious Roberto Beltran, aka, AKA Papa Grande, who became the counterculture hipster's go-to marijuana vendor. Or you can read about Arturo El Negro Durazo, the, the Mexico City police chief who built a mock Greek palace uh, dubbed the Parthenon with the proceeds from the cocaine trade. But I hope at least there is more to this book than just some entertaining vignettes and the readers come away with essentially four points about the Mexican drug trade. I'm gonna end my talk with these four points. The first is the most obvious point. The driving force of the drug trade is and always has been economic. America has an enduring and enormous appetite for, uh, for narcotics. In the late 19th century, according to some estimates, between two and 4% of the US population uh, was addicted to morphine. A century later, America was consuming up to 70% of all the world's cocaine. The American hunger for intoxication has always dwarfed that of Mexicans. In the 1970s, for example, there were around 600,000 American heroin addicts. Uh, when the UN tried to do a survey of Mexican heroin addicts, they could not find a single one in 20,000 people surveyed. Now this ceaseless US demand has merged with the persistent poverty of the average Mexican. Even during the middle day, decades of the 20th century, when Mexico was riding a kind of China-like wave of economic growth, average wages rarely reached 10% of those in the North. Uh, nowadays, you can earn the average annual Mexican wage by working 15 days in the United States. This combination of high demand and low wages has generated enormous incentives to produce and traffic drugs. Now there's no established way to assess these incentives. Uh, so I came up with my own. It is an estimate of the quantities of various narcotics a Mexican would have to sell wholesale in the United States to earn the average Mexican wage. Now the results are pretty telling. Over the past 50 years, on average, to earn the median wage, a Mexican would have to sell 700 grams of marijuana, 
18 grams of heroin or 66 grams of cocaine on the US streets. It amounts to weed weighing two cans of soup, coke weighing a tennis ball, or smack weighing just three US quarters. And that's only the average. During the economic collapse of the mid 1980s, you could earn uh, as much growing a single marijuana plant or a window box of poppies as driving a cab for a year. So the first point then is economic and it drives the narrative of the book and the US market for drugs is in some ways a kind of character in the book itself. And it motors changes in the Mexican trade. The second, perhaps more surprising finding concerns the relationship between the drug trade and the authorities. Since governments prohibited drug trafficking in the 1910s, many Mexican politicians have sought to harness the income from the illegal trade. And as long as the drugs went north and the trade caused limited social or political fallout and no one blamed the politicians, frankly, who cared? In general, those politicians have taken a cut by instituting what I call drug protection rackets. That is, they've charged certain favoured wholesalers or traffickers a fee or a percentage of the profits to protect their enterprises and not to apply the law. Those that have refused to pay, they've arrested or at times murdered. For over a century, observers have deemed this corruption. Uh, but corruption, I find, is an imprecise and not terribly helpful term. Such a blanket expression obscures what has been a subtle and a shifting set of arrangements. Up until the 1970s, these protection rackets were controlled by state governments. They were manned by the state police. Though many of these officials got very rich, there were limits. Authorities sought to distribute at least some of the drug funds, either through official state programs, like school or road building, or by forcing uh, the traffickers into acts of individual philanthropy. And they, stalked, they sought to check violent disputes associated with the trade. To do otherwise to, was to risk US or Mexican federal intervention. During the 70s, national institutions, in particular the PJF, the uh, Federal Judicial Police, took over these local state protection rackets. And they referred to their regional protection rackets as their plazas. Corruption changed from a mechanism that greased the wheels and oiled the machine to what political scientists now term grand corruption. These new racketeers no longer hailed from the region they controlled. They had no links with the communities they extorted. So they stole more, they distributed less, and they became increasingly casual about the use of violence. Since 1990, corruption has shifted once more. Increased drug profits and declining state power have upended the old protection rackets. In many regions of Mexico, the traffickers still pay the authorities, but now the traffickers are in charge. They control the protection rackets and they decide the rules of the game. Political scientists have come up with a term for this arrangement. They call it state capture, although it should be said that they've only captured a very small part of the state, the part that used to run the protection rackets. Mexican corruption then has attracted the headlines and the oversimplified cultural explanations. It is as eternal as the Aztec sun, declared one uh, Mexican foreign correspondent. And it's become firmly entrenched in the myths surrounding the drug trade. Yet as I discovered, corruption never stopped at the border. Stories of hard-nosed sheriffs and principal drug agents mask similarly entrenched corruption on the US side. Just as in Mexico, the enormous profits from the trade have been very tough to resist from customs officers, the DEA, uh, local law enforcement, and even the CIA have all looked the other way while overtly protecting the trade. However, unlike in Mexico, American observers have been very resistant to investigate these claims or declare any systemic fault. This is despite the fact uh, that the first Met American drug agency, the FBN, was closed down because of corruption. They suspected about a third of their agents were on the take. The next American drug agency, the BNDD, was closed down after only five years when it was discovered the assistant to the head of that agency was also uh, a member of the mafia. Uh, and various DEA corruption scandals, which again have not, have, however, not closed that agency down. 
The third finding that I made then relates to counter narcotics policies. Drug myths suggest that punitive policies are logical and necessary responses to genuine threats. Policy hawks, target kingpins or peddlers or cultivators because they believe this is the most efficient way to stop Americans injecting or smoking or snorting. But studying a country of, uh, sorry, st studying a century of counter narcotics efforts reveals that such policies are rarely implemented for their effectiveness. They are driven instead by invented panics, the need for bureaucratic fundraising and managerial scapegoating. They target whatever group is deemed easiest to cow, capture and sell to the public as a victory. And they are supported by the relentless manipulation of facts and figures through administrative straight sleight of hand, the deliberate distortion of evidence or straight out lying. There was not a DE agent I didn't meet that didn't admit that he or others inflated the amount of coke or heroin they found with milk powder. The vast majority simply expanded the amount that they had uh, they declared that they had found or they accused other people of doing so. Furthermore, these policies never actually fulfill their aims. Cutting supply never raises prices and lowers US addiction rates for more than a few months. American drug demand is simply too large. The incentives are too great. And patterns of drug taking are broadly independent of supply. In fact, the two most successful campaigns against Mexican drug production, which did genuinely bring down production in the 40s and the 70s, were followed by a massive rise in US heroin addiction and a huge escalation in US cocaine addiction, respectively. So supply side counter narcotics never works. What these kind of unforgiving counter narcotics policies do cause, however, is increased violence. And this brings me to my fourth and final finding, which concerns the connection between the drug trade and the use of force. Many commentators argue the narcotics business inevitably generates violence. It is, in the words of one official, in the DNA of the trade. And they give many reasons for the inevitability of this violence. The stakes are high, the trade attracts criminals and sociopaths, and without official regulation, disputes are decided by force. Over the past 15 years, at least in Mexico, this has not been a difficult claim to make. Yet it's important, I think, not to let contemporary horror obscure both the history of the trade and the origins of the violence. Up to the 1970s, violence was very rarely employed to sort out disputes between traffickers. The trade was peaceful. Cooperation was the rule. Deep ties of blood and marriage and friendship and neighborhood, which linked many of the traffickers, prevented the frequent use of force. In general, so did the local protection rackets. Both state governors and state cops were very keen to avoid conflicts that risked exposing their own ties to the traffickers. Instead, throughout this period, the causes of violence were twofold. These causes originated not from inside the world of the drug trade, but from inside the state. Occasionally then, new state authorities attempted to overturn the old protection rackets and institute their own. To do so, they tracked down powerful traffickers and had them arrested or killed. They then placed their own compliant traffickers in their place. The new state authorities could claim to the US and to the Mexican feds that they were taking serious action on counter narcotics. They could also capture the protection racket for themselves. Yet this strategy was pretty high risk. If the new authorities failed to control or eliminate the powerful traffickers, the attempted takeover could develop into a bloody conflict. And such conflicts over who owned the drug protection rackets dot the early years of the trade. There were outbreaks of violence in Ciudad Juarez in the early 30s, in Sinaloa in the 1940s, and again in Sinaloa in the late 1960s. Yet such conflicts have become much more frequent. Over the past 40 years, increasing numbers of groups have vied for control of the drug protection rackets. 
they no longer comprise just warring local politicians, but also federal cops, secret service agents, and the drug traffickers themselves. What is described often as a conflict over the drug trade is often actually a conflict over the control of the drug protection racket. Furthermore, over the past 15 years, many gangs have attempted to extend these protection rackets from narcotics to other commercial enterprises. It is these attempts that have spread violence beyond the areas where drugs are traditionally grown and smuggled. Criminals now demand protection money from everyone, from car thieves and human traffickers to local businessmen, truck drivers and avocado farmers. These new victims might be different, but the rules are the same, pay up or get killed. The other principal cause of the violence has been the war on drugs itself. In Mexico, aggressive counter-narcotics policing was pretty slow to take off. US diplomatic bullying forced law changes in the 40s. And by the early 50s, there was a relatively forceful militarized eradication campaign. Conflicts did increase, but for the most powerful traffickers, punishment was rare. And there were multiple ways to avoid capture or long imprisonment. In the 70s, Nixon's drug war transformed counter-narcotics policing south of the border. US drug agents, Mexican cops, and Mexican soldiers descended on areas of drug production and trafficking, basically like a colonial or an invading army. They arrested tens of thousands, they tortured thousands, and they certainly killed hundreds. They racked up their own body count. But there were similar US-backed escalations of drug policing, after the murder of the DEA agent Enrique Quique Camarena in 85, and again with the election of Felipe Calderon in 2006. Yet beyond the direct victims of these state policing operations, such uncompromising policing also had a crucial secondary effect that I think we massively underestimate. As the risks increased, drug traffickers turned on one another to avoid the threat of capture or worse. The cooperation that had marked the first half century of the trade decreased and then evaporated almost completely. Traffickers then gave evidence on each other to escape long sentences, avoid torture or save their families. And traffickers killed anyone suspected of being a police informer. And the authorities encouraged this. In actual fact, the DEA have a term for it. They call it divide and conquer. It is the DEA and the Mexican authorities that over the last 20 years have often been the people deliberately dividing the cartels against one another. And this is causing uh, a lot of the violence. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Um, that leaves us uh, a good uh, time uh, for questions and comments. Uh, as you know, please. Uh, raise your hand uh, on the uh, Zoom function, and I will call on you to ask your question. Um, I guess, uh, Camilo, you are first. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this presentation and a really wonderful book. Um, I, I have a question about um, where the army fits in this story. Um, if, if, if I understand well, there's like a an increasing scale of the uh, protection rackets going from the local to the state to the federal level. Um, but but uh, is, is, is there a point where, where it's clear that, that the army takes, uh, takes over the protection rackets? Or I guess the question is, um, do, does the army act as a single unified national institution or each military zone commander has its own game? Um, yeah, because throughout the book, there, there are many parts where, uh, I, I don't know, in the 70s, you talk about the, the uh, battles or the wars between the judicial and the state police. And like the army is always there, but it's never fully clear, at least it was not to me, um, what, what role in general it played, being that it's, you know, the only really national and by far in terms of weaponry and organization, most powerful uh, armed institution in the country, right? So, yeah, w what's up with the army in all this? Thank you. That, that's an extraordinarily good question. Uh, and in actual fact, you have a nose for large holes in the book, which I was basically asked to remove because there were too many players 
uh, kind of obscuring the readability. So you're absolutely correct. The army does play an absolutely crucial role in the protection of these um, uh, drug trafficking and drug smuggling. I would say that this normally works on a highly local level, depending on the relationship between the, um, uh, the zone commanders uh, and uh, the local politicians or the state governor. So up in the uh, Sinaloa in the 1950s, it seems pretty clear to me uh, that the, uh, they put a zone commander in charge. And I'm sorry, my, my memory is gone. I can't remember the guy's name. Uh, but he comes from Badia de Guato, which is incredibly rare. You never put a zone commander um, from, that, from that village in charge, right? So they put this guy in charge and suddenly uh, the army and the federal cops weren't finding any marijuana. De and deaths decreased massively. So there seemed to be some arrangement come to between that Badia de Guato zone commander um, and uh, the state uh, government that was running the protection racket. Similar things happening uh, during a similar period up on uh, kind of Eastern Mexico and Tamaulipas, uh, kind of um, Nuevo Laredo, Matamoros, where I think it's Bonifacio Salinas, um, who becomes a major, uh, and this is discussed quite a lot by Flores Perez um, in both his uh, books on the drug trade of Eastern, Northeastern Mexico. So again, arrangements between uh, the uh, the military and uh, the state governors. During the 1970s, it would appear that the military effectively join uh, with the PJF and the DFS, which is some is pretty unsurprising because basically a lot of the PJF and the DFS actually come are former military, so they have kind of strong contacts. So effectively, the military um, acts um, it brought most of the time it acts together with whoever, whichever federal authority is meant to be in charge. Um, so during the late 1970s, it's the PJF, during the early 1980s, it's the military mostly acting with the D in, in concert with the DFS. Uh, so it's always there. I will say the other thing is, is, is getting, getting declassified documents on the military, as I'm sure anyone who's trying to kind of study anything post 1940s, notoriously difficult. You can get pretty good declassified documents on the DFS and the PJF um, and the DEA were keeping an eye on um, PJF and DFS agents. However, as soon as you get to military generals, if it's foyered, it'll be blacked out. The military are just untouchable in terms of getting that declassified, those declassified documents. So it's much, much more difficult to find if there's some kind of systematic corruption. But that, that's an excellent, it's an excellent question. And one that Thank I can you. speak to today. Yeah. yeah um, any other questions? Well, let me just jump in while the other questions line up on, on that. I mean, I'm bearing in mind, of course, the archival difficulties you just mentioned. But um, I mean, I wonder whether there's any sense of, of any evolution in the involvement of the military. I mean, you know, beyond the so, for example, the the you know very you know uh, sensational accusations and the arrest of General Cienfuegos. I mean. How does that sound to you? I mean, and without asking you to, you know, have special knowledge that is very difficult to get. I mean, I just say, is there some kind of pattern here that one could discern in terms of increasing or more high level involvement as time goes by in the last 30, 40 years? Or is it very difficult to see any pattern in that? Um, well, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that the fairly high level guys were involved in it or involved in making deals or packs with drug traffickers and drug smugglers from the 1970s. In actual fact, um, I mean, I think the dirty war, and I think this is, has been looked at by Alex Avina, Adela Cedillo, uh, and also by Sergio Aguayo, that many of the, the kind of actors, the, the kind of major off the books hitmen um, of the kind of 70s in Guerrero, or up in the Chihuahua Sierra, or even in Guadalajara, in the, in the city of Guadalajara, were drug traffickers employed by uh, generals. Uh, and these drug traffickers were, were, were protected by the generals and they did the generals dirty work. So in Guadalajara, it was a guy called um, Sergio Aguayo has written quite a lot about him in, in uh, I think, uh, El Pelacuas. Um, but down in Guerrero, there's a group called the Grupo Sangre, uh, which is employed by um, uh, the military to go after members of the Partido de los Pobres. So I think they were doing this in the 1970s. The one thing I would say about the Sin Fuegos thing, which I think, you know, people perhaps we don't recognize enough, is that 
I'm ab- I'm I'm fairly sure that he was to- I'm fairly sure that most a lot of military people uh, take money, but he was also doing good drug policing, right? To do drug policing is uh, bring, breaking apart drug networks is really difficult, right? Because because dr- drug crime is a very strange crime. It has no real direct uh, victim, i.e., you don't get people who get sold dodgy heroin going into the DEA office and going, I got sold some dodgy heroin. So you've basically got to infiltrate and split apart these drug networks. And effectively what Cienfuegos seems to have been doing was allying against what for or allying with one Nayarit group to get information on another. Now he was taking money from that Nayarit group uh, in order to do so. Um, but he was also using that to go after another group of Nayarit traffickers. And I think this is effectively how that, you know, I think this is probably what Genaro Garcia Luna was doing as well. This is how the, the drug trade is for. It's why the DEA broadly accepts it. It's because that's how you fight the drug war. You need intelligence. How do you get that intelligence? Well, you need other drug traffickers to give you that intelligence. Because this is not like pe- picking people up on the corners in Baltimore, where you can effectively just drive a, a you know, you can basically, you know, see the people selling the drug. All this stuff is, you know, it's 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 stored inside warehouses or in trucks. It's much less easy to kind of police just with street cops. So you need intelligence, which means you need people inside the cartels. So I thought I've opened up another question there, perhaps. Surely you have. I mean, we can go back to that in a moment, but let me see if there are any, any different questions or we can continue to pursue this. I'm sure there are. Just raise your hand on the Zoom function and I'll call on you. I guess you've shocked them all, but I doubt that that'll last very long. No, no, I have not shocked them. I mean, um, a lot of this, uh, not, I mean, this is not entirely original, although it did strike me. I spoke to quite a lot of DE agents who broadly admitted this. Um, but it's also it's also there in the somewhat impenetrable text of Annabelle Hernandez's extraordinary, but again slightly impenetrable and and, and conspiratorial El Traidor. But it, it's it's made co- quite clear that the reason that Chapo was given a free ride for about a decade was effectively he was working for the Mexican Feds and then the DEA. And, and, okay, and, and that's yeah, then, how took people down. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Wasserman, you're next. I, I just had a quick question. When when you were looking into all of this, were you ever afraid? Were you ever scared? Very, very young. You're, you're, uh, you're, you know, going back to grad school, are you, Mark? No, I'm joking. Sorry, I'm being uh, 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 joking now. Uh, so, um, uh, I did have to leave. Mexico at very short notice, uh, and that was quite scary. Uh, but I'd rather not talk about that if, if that's all right. Uh, so broadly, my impression was that I mean, frankly, no one. I mean, you know, people would always throw up that lots of journalists got killed, uh, but they're Mexican journalists, right? Um, uh, so, um, and they're mostly people who are discovering kind of local protection rackets or local local crime, and I wasn't doing that. The only time where I thought I'm, when I did have to kind of leave fairly early is I think we're broadly were mistaken for possible American a, like DEA agents or something um, because we were living in a I made the incredible I can tell you this is a fantastically stupid thing to do. I thought I was being a um, uh, a clever his I went to, I, I moved into a hotel in Cuyacan called uh, El Mayo. Uh, now El Mayo is all over the early NARA documents. Uh, as the first ever money laundered hotel. So I thought it would be well, really interesting and kind of historically important to go and stay in this hotel. Now, I should have been I should have been fairly wary about this when I phoned them up. Uh, well, no, so I, when I tried to book online and it didn't have any spaces. Uh, and then I phoned them up and said, do you have any spaces? And said, well, yeah, we've got no rooms booked, which seems to indicate that it's still being used as money laundering. Uh, and then I discovered that in, uh, uh, in Annabel Hernandez's book, it was named as it was called El Mayo and El Mayo tried to buy it. Uh, in actual fact, it might be named after him. So by living in that hotel, some quite shady people were a bit surprised why a you know, noticeable non-Mexican was living there. And anyway, so I had to leave. But I'm not really prepared to really go into how it panned out. It was just not very pleasant.
Right, Dane, you're next. That shot everyone up. Yeah, Dane. Uh, ben, I, I, I have a question. I mean, you, you've described uh, systems or, well, I guess my question is whether you you are describing systems or one system, because you've talked about changes in components which happen sequentially, but is there anything you would call, I don't know, an epistemic rupture where the object of your study really became different uh, at, at any point in time? Uh, okay, could you uh, could you just bury down to what you mean quite by an epistemic rupture? Well, uh, a, a, a shift in the nature of uh, of commerce in in illegal drugs, a shift in the nature of the state, a shift in the nature of of political power that's so profound that you're not really talking about the same thing at the at the beginning and at the end of your process. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, broadly, there are two changes. Uh, the first is the, uh, the 1990s, which I think is, I mean, this is, again, not terribly original, but Trejo and Ley um, have written quite a good book um, dealing, dealing predominantly with that period, although I kind of disagree with them quite what happened during that period. But in terms of the causes, they see two essential causes. One is just the sheer value of the drug trade goes through the roof in that period um, for two reasons. One reason is, I think, which everyone knows, is they basically uh, gradually dismantle bits of the kind of Colombian network. Uh, they threaten Colombian kingpins with extradition. They cut off the the, uh, the Caribbean um, way in. So Mexico starts to transport a lot of the cocaine through its borders, right? They think somewhere around 95% by the end of the 1990s. Um, NAFTA obviously helps that. It's incredibly easy. So I think somebody worked out that there were what was it uh 16 million vehicles crossing is it 16 million vehicles crossing per year and you could fit all of america's cocaine in, into 30 of them um so it's incredibly easy to, to to do it the other thing that happened is the colombians basically started to give mexicans a bigger cut of the pot uh so effectively up to about 1990 a mexican uh drug traffickers would be getting about a thousand dollars per um per kilo of cocaine um after 1990, and no one knows quite the date, some kind of Carly accountant claims about 1993, El Señor de los Cielos was getting um, one kilo of cocaine per kilo he transported through. So for two kilos, rather than getting $2,000, he got $25,000. So it basically sticks a zero on the amount of money. Now, at the same time, you've got the, uh, you've basically got competing uh You've got democratization, which is creating loads of competing groups, all competing for a slice of the protection money. Um, you've got the you've got the PRD in Michoacan, you've got the PAN in, in Baja California and in Chihuahua. All of these are now basically using their own state police to try and take over bits of the protection racket and allying with cartels in order to do this. So that's a ma I think that's a really that's a huge change. That's where it basically that's where you start to find kind of you know mass graves out in outside Ciudad Juarez uh this is when we're talking about hundreds of people dying per year not thousands yet the other massive change that I think again everyone would acknowledge but I think perhaps hasn't been hasn't been fo fully developed is that during the early 2000s probably started by the Zetas but quickly adopted by other groups um Drug traffickers, many drug trafficking groups become much less interested in trafficking narcotics and much more interested in protecting other forms of organized crime and then providing the protection for licit businesses. So the people that I talk to now that I deal with kind of in, in, in refugees, the vast majority have got nothing to do with the drug businesses. As I was saying, they own avocado farms. This is what has basically decentered the violence away from Juarez, Tijuana and the growing regions. Um, you know, and I, I, in the book, I said, you know, one of the things I think that really hit home to me was was when I was living in Oaxaca in 2013, and the cantina I used to go to that was drunk in by Malcolm Lowry um, about 80 years ago. The Zetas just came in and, and, and shot the owner because he hadn't paid them protection money. Um, and, a, and a friend of mine in the Oaxacan government said, yeah, he used to pay us. But then the Zetas moved in and basically just took hold of the trade to the protection trade. Of protecting the bars so i think those were the two big shifts that i saw which i'm afraid are not terribly historical well i mean they are in the past 
Thank you. Uh, Camilo, you had another question and then Patrick? Or actually yeah, let's do, let, let, let's, let me, Camilo, let me do Patrick first because you already asked and I'll come back to you. Patrick, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Ben, thanks so much for this. I've got your book on the shelf right next to me, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. So I hope that uh, the question doesn't, doesn't betray too much ignorance. So at the top of my, uh, at the top of my pile, one of the things I'm most excited to, to read in the near future. Um, I, I wonder uh, if you had an opportunity in all of this to look at the kind of parallel action of, uh, of the smuggling of arms uh, that goes along with the, um, you know, the smuggling of narcotics northward. We, you know, the the there was that recent action by the Mexican government to uh, to sue American arms manufacturers. It seems unlikely to me to go anywhere in the courts, but you know, it's symbolic of a of a broader problem. And uh, I wonder if that's something that you either addressed in the book or have additional thoughts about on the basis of having done the research. Maybe it didn't get into the book. Thank you very uh, much for the, for the for the book and the presentation. Oh, don't worry, man. That's cool. Um, so, uh, in very briefly, yes, I do go to it in the in the last two chapters. I think, as uh, many of the reviews of Goodreads will point out, it doesn't perhaps have enough depth uh, in uh, dealing with the kind of '90s through to the 2000s. Partly because I'm a historian, I feel there's quite a lot of pretty decent political science and journalism uh, out there about that, although not in, always terribly cogent. But yes, I do deal with. To, not only is there a change in protection racket in, in basically what criminals are trying to protect in the 2000s, uh, there are two other changes which create an inordinate amount of violence, right? Um, so not simply are the strategies of organised crime groups changes. There's also a, two things play a massive multiplier effect. The first, as you rightly say, is guns, right? 2004, they changed the gun laws, suddenly... Um, Mexico gets flooded with automatic weapons, uh, which has been done. There's some extraordinary research that's been done uh, in Mexico. Also, one of the, uh, I mean, the, the person who is heading um, uh, AMLO's uh, attempt to do this in court, he was a former um, uh, student at LSE, a former PhD student at LSE, and wrote an excellent dissertation that really traced, really obviously, he went, to, he went through loads of the local um gun dealerships in the southern united states and traced how many he managed to get some de it's very difficult to get find details anti-constitutional obviously to find out how many guns anyone sold so that he did find out how many in some places they sell and then he could literally trace six months later just over the border in wherever it was via cunha or piedras negras there's a mass massive um uh, escalation in, in, in murders. I mean, the other thing that I think to, to really bear in mind is up to the 1990s, uh, Mexico's had uh, murders by shooting were about 20% of Mexican murders. Now they're about 70. So not only are there loads more murders, but people are doing it with guns now, um, which I think is really kind of uh, important. The other big multiplier, which I think, again, people, are, if, the, if the Americans... If Americans have their head in the sand over smuggling of arms, the Mexicans have a massive, their head massively in the sand over the uh, exponential growth of the Mexican uh, domestic drug market. Mm -hmm. that, that does something that really shocked me going to Juarez or going to Tijuana and talking to people around there was ju just quite how extensive it is that you can go to these places now and you know it's 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 crack pipes and it's needles and it's wraps and and you know it's it's um and 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 speaking to uh, lots of people who are claiming refugee status they all say that they got involved in trafficking or in selling initially because they were addicts um and this in some places this is absolutely um uh you know really epidemic you know epidemic i mean the violence of, of juarez and tijuana today are not cartels against cartels they're basically people fighting for corners yeah great thank you so much okay we have two more questions here let's see if we can get to both of them benjamin and then ines if you're brief maybe we can do them both uh, yes, uh, thank you, Professor. I have uh, two brief questions, actually. One is more conceptual. I, I understand you're a historian and might not want to, um, you know, give too much insight into this, but you mentioned that state capture is maybe a deficient way to think about this, and that also makes me think about, therefore, the deficiencies of a narco state to think about some of these issues. So what are, what does your historical study uh, tell us about 
different ways to conceptualize these systems. Are, are cartels parastate entities or paramilitary entities or how is the relationship? What is the relationship here between state and, and cartel? Uh, a second question is, is a bit more pointed. Um, what can you say about changes between, uh, or what can you say about the relationship between changes in public safety strategies in Mexico and uh, Mexican anti-narcotics operations? Um, you know, is militarization the only uh, variable that makes sense of these two things or are there other implications for this? Okay, so I can definitely uh, answer the first uh, uh, question, the conceptual question. So, um, yeah, I don't think, I mean, I've, I've just kind of tossed in state capture there. I, know, I mean, I know it really refers to the capture of, 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 it's used normally to refer to Eastern Europe, and it's the capture of bits of the state by private enterprise, and kind of Russia and Eastern Europe uh, 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 in the kind of 1990s. I also don't think narco state is terribly helpful. Uh, the, what I've effectively come up with, and I'm currently writing this at the moment, is a piece of historical sociology, which argues that effectively uh, Mexico has, I mean, we know famously Tilly says that, that, that state formation is, a, is an act of organised crime, that basically the state runs a protection racket. So effectively, it, it uh, extracts tax from companies and from individuals in return from protection, mostly protection of private property. Well, what Mexico does and what I think Colombia does and Brazil does, but also other um, uh, Indonesia, bits of India, they also have a parallel uh, form of state formation. And this is um, runs a, another protection racket. Now this protection racket doesn't deal with standard companies. It deals with the illicit economy. Um, and play, people like, the army and the police and uh, the secret agents, they offer protection to criminals, those involved in the drug trade or human trafficking or illegal logging. Um, and these people pay them bribes, which effectively sustain the army or the police. So I think in actual fact, you've basically got two protection rackets running in parallel. Um, and offering each other support. Uh, so that's my kind of conceptual idea. As I say, I've, I've offered Emilio, and I'm sure he's going to be thoroughly sick of me by the end of this, uh, but I've offered Emilio to give a, a conceptual talk on my his, historical sociology version of state formation and organised crime. Um, in terms of the relationship between uh, public safety and anti-narcotics operations, I mean, in very... In very uh, uh, basic terms, th there was very, very little concern for public safety when it cut when it came to anti -nar counter narcotics operation. It was often it was it was basically not talked about. Um, where where you can see it happen is uh, there were a kind of um, escalation of murders in the mid nineteen seventies in Culiacan. So a lot of the kind of uh, rich and powerful of of Culiacan, a lot of the merchants' families, um, they effectively demanded that the government fight its drug war not on in Culiacan but rather in the mountains because frankly they didn't give a shit about the peasants getting killed um so so often most often um yeah you know, really you know most often it's yeah counter narcotics operations over public safety Thank you, uh, Ines. Uh, we have just a few minutes, but if you want to ask your question, we'll try to wrap up with that. Thanks. Sure, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask whether you think um, if any decriminalization on the US side of consumption um, or any kind of demand side policies in the United States would have any effect um, in Mexico at all. And I mean, I, I don't think so. I'm an ignorant pessimist on the topic, but I would love to hear you um, talk a little bit about that if you can. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. It's the question I'm always asked. I mean, we can say from hi historically, decriminalizing or legalizing or medically legalizing marijuana did nothing. In natural fact, it probably accelerated the shift towards uh, criminal groups um, being involved in other forms of crime. I mean, one thing that decriminalization and decent treatment would do is stop 100,000 Americans dying of fentanyl overdoses per year, uh, which would seem to be a fairly important thing to do. But again, I mean, I, I was over the last two years, I suspect because of COVID, people have been somewhat inured to talking about this. But, it, you know, it was at the end of 
was it 2018 it was seven seventy thousand in 2020 a hundred thousand people died um so um so okay what what would happen if you decriminalized and treated um yeah heroin i, I mean i find that kind of question really 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 difficult to deal with um my assumption is that certainly some drug traffickers would go into the kind of legal trades uh, but then others would would and already are involved in fuel theft and human trafficking and extortion. So they would just stick to that. Or on a lot of the drugs would probably stay in Mexico. So Mexico now has, you know, a, a fairly big most Mexican marijuana stays in Mexico now. Uh, we have one minute left. Let's try Elizabeth. If you want to ask you a question quickly, we'll try to get to it and then we'll finish the seminar. Yes. Um, <clears throat> real quick, I don't know very much about um, the arms trade, but is there any literature linking our arms trade in the United States, our arms industry with violence in Mexico and like Central America, and we can say in the greater global spo uh, scope and its influence on immigration into the U.S.? Like it's uh, it's influence on immigration. I do not know of anything. Uh, the person to to ask about this is a guy called Carlos Perez Ricart, uh, L R I C A R T. Um, he run um, does a column in Sin Embargo. He was previously at Oxford. He's now at CDER. Uh, he's written a lot of kind of edited volumes uh, on and, and articles on this, and he knows all the people in the field. There are like five or six of them that are doing some really interesting work, including interviews with kind of aging hitmen, uh, where the hitmen go. You know, 2003, I had a knife and my boss had a crappy pistol that probably came from Central America. And then by 2005, we were all armed to the teeth. Uh, I had to learn how to, you know, fire a, you know, fire a kind of major caliber weapon. Um, so, yeah, there, there is really good work being done. If it how it relates to immigration. I'm not sure. I mean, there's, as far as I can make out, there's, there's and I, I work in immigration a lot. There is not huge amounts of work done on some of the driving forces behind migration in many of the most violent places in Mexico. I mean, we, it's really sad, but we don't really know what's going on in swathes of Guanajuato and Tamaulipas where the murder rate is actually, you know, off the, off the chart. Or recently I've been dealing with loads of people from, uh, from Puebla, uh, which again, I thought my assumption was a fairly peaceful state, but there seems to be a lot of kind of war between warring kind of Wichi Colero um, uh, outfits. Uh, so the homicide rate there has really gone up and the extortion rate. Okay, I think we'll end with that because we're out of time. Uh, but uh, Ben, uh, before I thank you, uh, I want to say that we will invite you back uh, to give you give us your piece of historical sociology and take a more, um, a more scholarly uh, tack here in the discussion. Um, but with that, I, I want to thank you for a very stimulating presentation. It is a fascinating book. I hope everyone will read it. And like I said, hopefully at some point in the beginning of next uh, year, uh, we'll bring him back for uh, a further conversation on the same issues, but from a different angle. Thank you all of you for being here. We look forward to seeing you again in the next seminar. And thank you again to Benjamin Smith for his work and for uh, joining us in this uh, really uh, thought-provoking seminar. Good Thank afternoon, you. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Good night. Gracias. Thank you. Goodbye. De nada.